to nudge the, the, the TSC on some, some recent threads. Um, uh, kind of a hot July compared to uh, um, probably expectations, given that everyone um, likely extended, the, at least in the U.S., the, the usual Fourth of July um, vacation times with you know the week. Um, we'll hit a similar days like this in August with Europe, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Asia, they never take vacations out there, so <laughs> um, never really have that issue. But uh, um, given it's a light week um, from that, the formal perspective, we can probably breeze through these in you know a half hour, 40 minutes, and really it's just about nudging people back to conversations that are happening on the on the forum mostly, but. Uh, Todd, why don't you get started on the, the first couple, and then then I'll jump. We'll jump in on the other three. Sure thing. Uh, the first quick reminder is the annual TSC elections will be uh, starting in early August. Um, so that's for the eleven TSC seats. Uh, it's for all contributors and maintainers. We will be working on pulling together that list, uh, much like we did last year at this time. Uh, and sharing the list with everyone on this call and more broadly on the technical list, just so that everyone can ensure that if they're meant to be on that, uh, as someone that is able to nominate themselves, that they are uh, certainly able to. Uh, and we'll also follow up with some more details on the specific timelines uh, on the election, just to make sure everyone's comfortable with that. Uh, and once that's ready, we'll get that kicked off in early to middle uh, of August, looking to wrap up uh, right at the end of summer. Uh, and then after that, we'll move forward with electing uh, a new TSC chair as well. Any and questions? Todd, that's for, uh, that'll be for people who contributed up to what date? Um, we will, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, that's part of what we're looking at in terms of uh, finalizing the time timeline, um, but I suspect uh, right up until early August, we, we had it pretty close to the nomination point um, last year. Okay, thanks. Any other questions there? All right, uh, onward to Hackfest planning. Um, Brian, before I um, talk kind of more specifically on dates or locations, do you want to just talk quickly kind of overall Hackfest um, thoughts, strategy, uh, et cetera, and just yeah. back there? Yeah, um, so we had we had a pretty good uh, Hackfest in China. We had about 95 participants there, and and thank you to to Chris and to Arno and and to Makoto and others who came in from out, out of the country to um, help build, be the bridge there. It was really useful as a way to bring a lot of our members and developers from from our core China companies uh, in closer into the development cycle. It felt a little more like a like a mini conference than a than a true Hackfest, but um, it did trigger, you know, uh, some conversations, some thoughts about just making sure that, you know, the, the technical steering committee here um, views having, you know, Hackfest roaming around uh, different parts of the globe once every two months, uh, about on average once every two months, is is the right format, is the right pace, is something that people still find useful. Um, uh, there's no doubt that there's utility in the face-to-face, -face, but we also want to make sure that people feel like the travel time and the two days that they put into this is of high value to them uh, and their employers and all that. Um, and so, as we think about planning the one in the, uh, one in for the, uh, the U.S. in September and one later on in Europe, um, just want to make sure that that the enthusiasm is there, uh, that the uh, belief that it's the right format, an unconference kind of you know self-directed kind of thing is there, um, and that folks in the TSC are are interested in taking um, leadership and defining the agendas and, and leading conversations there. Um, uh, and then and then that can be a useful guide to us at the Linux Foundation in terms of the right way to support uh, these projects, uh, the right decisions around location and timing and that sort of thing. So that's an invitation for anybody on the call if you want to express an opinion about Hackfest, right or wrong, um, uh, right format. Uh, we can take a few questions here. We could also then take it back to the list. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, just uh, wanted to level set. Any thoughts? My only concern is travel budget. If they're every two months versus every three months or something like that, that's a couple extra. Mm -hmm. And it could be in the earlier days of the community, having a pretty frequent pace was a good way to keep momentum going and, and light the fire, so to speak. And um, moving to about every three months might be a more um, 
uh, a, a more affordable pace for sure, especially for the committed developers who feel a need to, to be at each one of these, which would be really nice. It'd be really nice to have that, you know, kind of core that keeps coming to every one of these. Hart, did you want to say your idea on the call? Sure. Um, I just said something in chat. Um, I think it might be a good idea to have kind of a a more well-defined structure. If we, if we want these to be hack fests and not actual conferences, and we want people to kind of get their hands wet with everything, uh, we might want to to change the format a little bit. Uh, so we kind of have uh, we we just intentionally leave say you know a part free for hacking because right now uh, you know I, I don't know that this is necessarily a bad thing, but it uh, particularly recently all of these have sort of become more conference-like where there's just talks and meetings and, and just the schedule is full, I guess. And people seem mm -hmm. to prefer uh, sitting in on talks to, to hacking. Uh, so everybody just ends up, you know, sitting in on two days of talks, which isn't a bad thing necessarily, um, but we should figure out, you know, exactly what we want to get out of these, I guess. Right. Would it make sense to do like two days of meetings and a day of hacking at the end or something like that? Um, personally, I'm not contributing a lot of code to any of the projects. I'm, you know, looking more at the working groups. I don't know how many other people are more focused on working groups than developing code. But that's, well, we've always tried to make selfish view. We've always, <laughs> we've always tried to make room at the hackfest for those who just want to hack. You know, places where they can go off to the side. Um, I think the key question is, you know, does anyone do that if you know there's a, a fear of missing out? <laughs> if uh, uh, if there's presentations being given or, or talks being led, you know, does that become a, an attractive nuisance um, uh, <laughs> uh, that makes it hard to, to peel away with a couple of people and start working on code? Um, so maybe hard to reframe maybe the, the idea is yeah reserve the afternoon for for no presentations or guided talks um but what we find is that a lot of people who show up at the hack fest are still pretty new um and so at the very least need you know some guidance guidance on getting a dev environment set up and that sort of thing before they can jump into to really coding um and so i think we need to provide room for that kind of activity as well. And sometimes that works better with somebody in the front, of, you know, classroom style, kind of leading the group through, sometimes better one on one. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, Brian, I've always thought that, Brian, I was going to say, I've always thought that hack hackathons were better when, like, on the, the beginning or, say, the morning of each day, there would be like a 10 minute, somebody would peel off and say, hey, if you need help getting set up and getting going, you know, come with me and then kind of have a side talk where you just do, like you said, classroom style to get dev environments set up and stuff. So mm -hmm. just kind of be aware that you're going to have people who are new to the community there and uh, plan for a little bit of content for them just so that they don't drag everybody else down, you know, asking questions or feeling excluded because they don't know how to build the code just yet. Well, and in fact, the the, the re-engage the engagement of new people in the community is often a way to surface out bugs in not just the code, but in the onboarding process, in the you know the learning curve where there are unreasonable obstacles to learning curve, that sort of thing. And so, like I've I've, I've been a, a fan from the outside of Facebook's premise that when you're if you're hired as an engineer, you should be able to um, commit code and have it pushed to production on your first day, right? Um, and uh, and and by the sound of it, most developers succeed in doing that. Whether that's a good idea, move fast and break things for us, I don't know. But uh, um, I like the idea of setting as a goal that if you show up at a hack fest and you are a developer, you should be able to push a contribution of some sort, um, you know, a bug fix or you know, some sample code or even a doc fix or something like that by the end of those two days. Um, maybe that becomes kind of more of the focus for the hack fest is, is this kind of bootstrapping and you know, bringing bringing new devs into the community. Um, I really like that idea. It's a good idea. Yeah, and and as well, like Pippin is pointing out, getting getting um, folks from different projects to talk to each other 
um because it's so easy to ignore it let that not happen when we're focused on chat that sort of thing um uh, is a good a good thing to have happen at a hack life right that's why i've i've loved many of the presentations because they've been intentionally attempts to reach across across the aisle so to speak yeah so i i kind of like uh the theme of all this it sounds like maybe if we will um have a little bit more time between the the hack fest that gives us a little more time for a bit of structure it's still probably good to have that on conference format where we can be pretty flexible right up to the day of the conference or the day of the the hack fest but allocate a little bit of time for prepared presentations a little bit of time for ramping uh new participants make sure that we've got kind of like a, a newbie area or something to get people on board with with the projects that they're interested in and then also some time for maybe uh kind of experienced hacking where we've got some project to project work or, or something like that okay okay well, these are for the oh, good for the september conference hack fest are you planning on a public one as well as the hyperledger one I know some sometimes you've done like two separate things. Well, we've done um well there is there is a thought that we didn't actually execute on, but a thought that in China we would do a hackathon um and then that would lead into the hack fest and we just, just decided for bandwidth and, and cost reasons um to focus on the hack fest and I think that was the right decision. Um uh, we've also co-located these things with other developer conferences. Um, we had one close to uh, Construct, you know, here in San Francisco back at the beginning of this year. The other one, you know, two weeks ago in China was close to the Linux con happening there. Um, so, so we try to correlate them to help make it easier for people to justify the travel, I think, um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, other things like that. But, uh, um, but they're always public. Every one of these things, you know, anybody can can show up at them. Um, we hope we get the core contributors, but we want to make clear that that we want uh, even newbies to come in and want the learning curve there. So, um, anyway, why don't we talk then? Um, you know, there's there's more. I would encourage folks to share over, over the TFC mailing list if there's some other ideas here. But I'm hearing still general support for the idea of having access, the idea of keeping them open uh, to folks and and uh, and, a, and the similar structure just raising the um, importance and, and the profile of uh, just focus, sessions focused purely on getting tables of devs together to write code kind of undistracted by a talking head up on a stage <laughs> um, uh, you know uh, 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 and make sure there's there's room for that and perhaps even avoiding the distraction in the, in the schedule for some stretches of that which sounds fine to me great to me I always feel pressure to add to the agenda so people feel like there's always something going on, but uh, I see the, the back side of that too. So, um, I wonder if one just added, uh, Go ahead, Leonard. Yeah, I was just saying, given focus to Mark's comment or recommendation that we spend half of the day in session, as in the working groups, um, you know, more from the conference perspective and the afternoon, we can devote that to more access, but to um, retain the flexibility that in certain days you might do more of one as opposed to the other. Um, I think Mark's idea initially we should look at and see if we can um, improve on that. So I'll put it back that noise. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, based on all these conversations, um, does it, it, people still feel like it's the right thing to be focusing on an event in the U.S mid to late September and another in Europe, um, which before the end of the year, probably, you know, November-ish, late October, November, maybe even early December. We do have a doodle poll, as Todd has uh, put into chat, for potential dates uh, for Europe. Um, regarding US, we have uh, a couple of weeks that are uh, that have been noted, um, uh, the, the 14th and 15th, 21st and 22nd. Um, uh, there are, I don't think there's any ideal date that doesn't have conflict for some folks out there. Um, but uh, uh, 21st and 22nd, I think was looking, looking, either one of these actually work for, for Linux Foundation staff. Um, 
uh, to support. And we do have um, some good options in Chicago for, for free, interesting spaces. And that's, that, that's a city that's easy to get to from just about anywhere else. So that's what we're looking at for Chicago. Um, and in Europe, I kind of try to drive folks to the doodle pool there. Um, but uh, OK, so, so unless, unless we hear strong indications against, we'll continue to move forward on planning for those two hack sites. And hope to see many of you there. Any other thoughts or comments? Yeah, yeah. so I just put some stuff in chat. Um, I think a lot more people would be interested if we got some kind of uh, toy projects and advertise them in advance of the Hackfest. You know, these don't have to be like, you know, super meaningful things. Um, I think like the, the Sawtooth Lake battleship or, you know, that, that, I mean, that may have ended up being pretty complicated, but, but just fun projects that people can get their, uh, their feet wet with coding. Um, we don't actually have to have people make significant contributions at the Hackfest. You know, it's only two days and, mm -hmm. you know, even the best people are only going to be able to do so much in two days. But we want to put people in position where they can make substantial contributions. And if we kind of get them started, get their feet wet, you know, that's oftentimes the, the most difficult part of the learning curve and where a lot of people, you know, stop. Um, so, so if we kind of get people over that hump, then we might, we might be able to gain more contributors, which I think is the ultimate goal of these things. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thanks for the feedback, everyone, and and we'll, uh, you know, the Hyperledger, Hyperledger staff will continue to move forward in planning these two events, and we'll have to see most of you there. Why don't we, uh, Todd? Why don't we move on to the next agenda item? Great. Uh, I think the next thing is the um, security code reviews and uh, bug bounties. And Brian, I know you kicked off a thread shortly ago on this. I did, and, and I apologize for getting it late up there. I intended to send it last night. Um, uh, but uh, I'll just briefly go through it. And, and Dave's on the line, too, and he, he's going to own this <laughs> going forward. Yeah. So um, I, I you know, uh, look, look to him for this. But, uh, but he and I have been, have been working, him mostly, actually, doing the legwork in um, setting up two, two things that we think will help uh, reassure the public about the, um, the, the security priorities at the, at the organization, right, for the code that goes out from here, especially code that carries a label of 1.0 and beyond, right? So um, the first of those is that uh, when we push code out, um, uh, as, as the different projects get closer to a 1.0, uh, the Linux Foundation is willing to fund um, uh, the cost of doing a proper security audit of the project. Um, we've been talking to different vendors. We get a rough swag of about 40K um, on average, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, we think that's important enough to fund um, at least at, a, at, you know, at, at some point in the young project life, you know, before it hits 1.0 um, or soon thereafter. Uh, and so we'll, we'll take that burden on. Um, and that's a way to help reassure all projects, you know, whether you are, um, have, have well, well financed friends or not, um, that, uh, uh, you're part of, you're part of something bigger here. Um, and obviously that still means that we need to be thinking about secure coding practices after that point. Um, hopefully the process of going through that will help burn into the minds of the maintainers. Uh, you know, what, what are, what's, what are code paths that lead to problems? Uh, what are the types of, you know, defensive programming that they should be doing more of, that sort of thing. But, uh, um, we think it's, it's suitable to do it one time. And if, if projects want to do it after that point and, and find a way to pay for it themselves, that's great. Um, uh, but we think that's the baseline that everybody carrying a 1.0 moniker from here should, should carry. The second is, it is bug bounties. Um, you know, it, I think it's been extraordinarily effective in certain parts of the open source world, particularly the web browser world, for companies to post um, public bug bounties for security vulnerabilities. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a really a big way, I think, of building trust in, um, um, and, uh, in public trust in uh, the, the, you know, the integrity of the code. Um, 
so we've in, started to engage a company um, they're called Hacker One. By the way, we haven't closed the, the deal with them yet, but we really like what they've been talking about. Um, and they have a baseline uh, service for bringing projects like us in, um, open source projects in particular, uh, and running a process with. They have a, a private hacker developer community that they've basically enlisted to do all sorts of different projects. Um, these are uh, gray hat hackers, <laughs> folks who. Uh, um, are also you know committed to the standard disclosure process um and uh, that's how they get their, their to be able to claim claim the prizes uh typically things like this start out very low values that you clear out a lot of the low-hanging fruit you know a couple of grand or less per per uh per vulnerability um but hopefully we get to the point where you know projects might have outstanding you know bug bounties in the tens of thousands or more right um I think uh, Chromium, um, which is kind of the gold standard here, has what a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars is the bug bounty. Um, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll get that high very soon, but uh, um, something that stands out there that says, "Okay, bring it," right? Um, and you'll get rewarded for it if you follow the right process. Um, so we'll fund the um, relationship with a company like HackerOne um, to set up a, this independent process. Um, but what we will need will be crowdfunding for the prizes on a per project basis. Um, uh, and so what we'd like to do is work with the vendors um, in this community around the different projects to fill a, a queue basically of prizes um, uh, for finding vulnerabilities in these different products. Um, uh, and that's a good way for the, I think the commercial community on each project to, to stand up and attest to their confidence in, in the code. Um, uh, it could be that the board figures out a way to um, distribute some funds equally uh, out there as well from from our core hyperledger fund, but uh, um, we think the validation that comes from having companies involved in filling that that those uh, those buckets uh, would actually be also a really good signal. So, with that, just wanted to put it out and open it for comments, and we can take comments on the list as well. But uh, um, just putting this out there. Any initial reaction? Uh, Richard, I think it's a good idea. The, 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 the certainly the, um, the funding, the security uh, audit, the um, I guess the tension in any project is always when to do it. Um, certainly, I look at you know, obviously Corona is not in this process um, at the moment, but um, you know, the question we ask ourselves is, you know, at what point do we do it? You know, when a situation you do it early and you, um, you you already know there are still issues, so it's why I pay someone to tell you what you already know. Leave it too late, and you you risk going live with no known issues. So. Um, um, whether it's whether it's something you call 1.0 or, or whatever you call it, but a milestone where you're saying to the world, you know, we think this thing is 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 broadly ready, or this thing, um, you know, is is useful for some scenarios that kind of feels like the right milestone. I think it's a good idea. Um, this is Nathan from on the Hyperledger Indie project. The Sovereign Foundation has sponsored this kind of audit, and it's in process right now. And I can't say that we've found anything that's groundbreaking or really surprising but it's been really healthy to have them digging through all the different parts of the code and also the different aspects of the design. Um, uh, it's helped our documentation mature, and it's also forced us to answer a lot of questions that, um, in, in a much more clear and concise way than we had answered before. Um, so both the uh, security audit as well as having a Hacker One profile have been helpful for us as a project. So I think that it would be of general interest and generally helpful to all the projects going forward at Hyperledger. Okay. Well, I'm um, happy to take more feedback from this, but uh, um, at this point, we're moving forward on both, uh, both these fronts. Um, and uh, and so let us know pretty soon if you if you have strong opinions different than than perhaps those directions. But um, uh, yeah, um, thanks for the positive feedback. Um, why don't we dive next to the next topic? And again, this is another nudge back to a thread um, kicked off recently on the the, the TSC list, which is. Um, just a, a, a quick discussion about third-party dependencies and the licenses on those dependencies. Um, 
I, I wrote up in my technical, in my typical uh, overly long fashion, perhaps. But um, the core thing is, um, when you've got an open source project that depends upon um, products under other licenses, um, uh, when you have a hyperledger project, at least, it depends upon projects under and code under other licenses. No problem at all. It can be proprietary. It can be any other license. Um, but it, but when it becomes an issue is when we redistribute those dependencies as a part of the package that one pulls down from the Hyperledger website, right? Um, and so when that when that happens, then what we need to do is look at those licenses, and if they are very uh, uh, different from the standard IP policy we have in the charter, which is Apache for code and and uh, uh, Creative Commons attribution license uh, for uh, for documentation. Then we need to. Yeah, this is the standard process. Go and get governing board approval for that. Um, and I think we've been um, pretty easy going uh, so far. Partly out of a you know we figured we needed the uh, the ground to settle a bit um, as projects made their way to 1.0 um, uh, to figure out what are the dependencies that really need to be included in the images that get redistributed. But um, a strict interpretation would be even code that's checked into the repository needs to fall, you know, even if it doesn't end up as part of the final image that gets redistributed, even that would need to, to get authorized because essentially, because it's in our repository, we are redistributing it. Um, so um, we are going through this process now with Fabric. Um, we've completed the audit uh, of, of the different packages. Thank you very much to the Fabric team for helping piece together all the licenses for this different third-party code. Um, and due to the nature of how Go works, we are bundling a lot of dependencies in rather than using operating system package management mechanisms to, to load those dependencies. Um, uh, the process has also been conducted, I think, on the other projects. I think Tracy said everything except uh, is it everything except Indy and Burrow. Um, That's right, Brian. Okay. Uh, so, and we'll be covering those soon. Um, so there should be tickets in your in your issue tracker for for any other things that we need to go and get approvals for. Um, but just wanted to, to highlight this to the developer community that you know this is I mean there's there's a process around that you know the earlier we can uh, address that um, and get approvals for that, the, the better. Um, uh, especially when some of the licenses, like some of the code in Fabric, isn't strictly OSI approved. It's under wacky licenses like the WTFPL, <laughs> um, uh, which, uh, well, looking like it's not a problem at all, uh, still requires overhead on the part of you know lawyers and others to look at and go, okay, this is this is benign, um, uh, etc. So, uh, anyways. Just a flag, and uh, if there's comments on it, happy to take feedback here or on the mailing list. Any thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to I wanted to add Brian. So I was thinking about what I wrote on the list yesterday, and I'll probably send out an update for that. But what we're scanning is just what's in your repository, right? So if you are building in those third-party dependencies without having them in your repository, I think that's still um, something to be on the lookout for. Right, um, where the license scan won't catch that, it's something that uh, the individual teams will have to catch. That's a good point. Any thoughts or comments, or should we just bump it to follow up on the thread? Okay, well, uh, not hearing other thoughts, uh, um, I will move on to the next uh, topic, project reporting. Um, Tracy, do you want to give a restate from the message you sent? Yeah, so um, the last TSC meeting that we had on June 15th, uh, we had brought up a proposal to do project reporting. Um, and uh, in, in that meeting, uh, we, we kind of took the the information to uh, the list to, to try and talk about it, right? Um, where people were interested in, in really looking at the metrics uh, instead of the project reporting, um, you know, and we didn't really get uh, a whole lot of response to the, the information on the, the metrics. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it seemed like we, we still have this open issue of how do we track projects, uh, the health of those projects, how do we uh, do oversight on those projects? 
And, and so, um, you know, I, I think it's still very appropriate that we, we talk about project reporting and, um, and what we want as a TSC, right, to uh, really understand how projects are um, behaving, how the communities are uh, either growing or, or not, as the case may be, right, and, and to really understand that the health of those projects. And so, um, you know, this, this was a, really a request to, to try and bring that conversation back to life and, and to understand um, what the TSC wants from an oversight perspective. Yeah, thanks for uh, orchestrating that, Tracy. I'm sorry I didn't uh, respond on the thread there. Uh, I did review uh, what you posted again this morning, though, and yeah, it looks like a, a valuable list of metrics. Um, I'm always doing trade-offs with what's uh, not really what's what's valuable or what's not valuable, but what is uh, really a, a trade-off in what's the most valuable thing that we we could be doing with any you know amount of time or resource. Uh, and I know that from, at least from my individual perspective, I don't feel like I'm doing as much coding as, as I feel would be constructive for the project. So when I kind of weigh against doing um, reporting or, or administrative kinds of functions versus doing more direct technical contributions, I'd, I'd prefer not to stack more things on that reporting or administrative side. So um, you know, I, I'm kind of inclined to hold off on more of these reporting activities maybe until uh, the projects have another year behind them and you know we can kind of see where things qualitatively feel to us like like they're growing stale or imbalanced and you know certainly if something acute happens we should be able to address it on the fly um, but maybe starting to build the the metrics you know a, a year out from now and so um, I, I, will, I will push back on that just a little bit, Dan, um, from the, the perspective of your role as a contributor to Hyperledger Sawtooth versus your role as uh, a member of the TSC, right? And um, what would you like to know more about the other projects that are happening, right? So uh, I, I take your point, obviously, right, that, that um, providing information and doing reporting is, uh, does take time. Right, but I think there's two separate roles that you have to consider um, in in what you're playing right now, and so I I would uh, I would ask kind of what do you think from your role as a TSC member um, you would want from understanding the what's happening in the other projects. Yeah, certainly I, I I appreciate that, and there is a distinction between roles there. I think even with wearing just a, a TSC hat, the kind of technical steering that I'd like to be providing is is maybe being more read on things like um, uh, the hash graph proposal that came through, and and devoting more in that technical direction. And then you know a, as we start to sense that that there might be issues with uh, with project health, you know, I think we can still address those without necessarily doing a monthly tracking. Maybe, maybe in an, in another parallel with with hash graph, you know, we, we could set up an explicit rule for things or, or try to quantify things directly. But the amount of time that we put into trying to do that um, that quantification might just be better spent. You know, more efficiently addressing things that we feel qualitatively. Yeah, I think one one way to think about this is there is a an, an a mandatory oversight role that has to be performed somewhere in the organization on on all projects, right? Um, from from the day that they enter, and that's just to make sure that a project uh, both isn't doing something acute and obvious and bad, but also hasn't become more abund um, or you know something that doesn't fulfill our claims when we say when something's a hyperledger project it is developed in the public it follows the, the processes you know that sort of thing right and so that oversight function you know if at, by default if no one else did it would be performed by the board right and the, <laughs> the governing board uh, who um, I, is very smart very capable but 
I think we've uh, succeeded for good reason in having the governing board trust the TSC to perform that role, right? Um, alternately, we could have the Hyperledger staff perform that role. Um, but I think in, in across these three different options, right, the governing board or Hyperledger staff or the TSC, um, if, if you're on a project that is underperforming from this perspective, you know, uh, who would you rather hear that message from, right? Who's going to be more of a, uh, of a democratic, you know, voice in managing that, that going down the road? It seems to me like it's the, the TSC. Now, the, my staff can do a lot of the legwork in collecting data, in um, organizing this process, nudging projects to the right thing. Um, it was what we planned to. That's what Tracy's full-time job is. Um, but at a certain point, there's a call that needs to be made if a project is underperforming, does it need to be, you know, excised from the project, right, or corrected in some way? Um, I, and, you know, so that oversight function, I think the TSC should fight for um, and 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 own um, as the, the technical heart and soul of the project. Um, if not, we can find another place in the organization for that role to be fulfilled. It doesn't sound like it needs to be exclusive. Um, but the, I mean, you were hinting, Brian, at um, some role for uh, staff to do the evaluations. Um, does it make sense for staff to do the evaluations and raise exceptions to the TSC? Mm -hmm. It makes sense for, for my staff to be involved enough in the project to be following and, and know whether what's being reported out from them is um, is what it should be, right? I think there's still an important role for the leaders on that project to play in um, in leading that 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 whether it's quarterly or monthly or whatever, but actually, you know, reporting back um, because if there isn't that sense of ownership there, there's probably not going to be a sense of ownership of fixing any problems that get noticed, right? So there there. The, I mean, the concern is status report for the sake of status report, um, as opposed to status report for the sake of um, actually evaluating the health of the project. Um, and and as the TSC, um, I don't want to be reviewing status reports that were generated for the sake of generating status reports. Um, so how do we, I mean, is it, it you know, I know we've had all these discussions before um, about cadence seems to be appropriate, um, uh, sort of um, managing exceptions rather than managing steady state. Um, but the, the, the kind of third one is um, just uh, the kind of what's new part of the projects um, is always nice to, to be able to hear and have as a kind of as a common topic for discussion. Um, do we need to use our weekly TSC time for those, or would it be possible to have um, a kind of a quarterly, um, longer meeting where we bring in um, projects for kind of a status update, uh, status what's new, what's planned um, on these calls? So, so not take our one hour and dedicate it to that, but actually have a, a two or three hour session um, quarterly that's set aside for exactly that purpose. I I really think if you take those two or three hours and spread them in the form of 10 minutes a week. Um, so here's my concern is that when a project does go quiet, then, you know, the ability to to fix that and bring them back into into well, if if, if a if project developers stop using the public tools, for example, and they start privately talking about about building the code, it gets harder and harder as time goes as time goes on to correct that behavior. If yeah. By the way, I was not I was not talking about the exceptions. The exceptions certainly could come in into the meeting. So, so it's partly like, how it, do you monitor how do you monitor for the exceptions and respond? Okay. Like I, I, I think yeah. it's more important to be agile and and um, respond quickly when you see a community that is not responding to bug reports is not responding to new users asking questions, right? Um, uh, and and are fixing that within, you know, a few weeks of it becoming a problem rather than realizing three months later that there haven't been any commits 
uh, or or you know triage of bugs in the, in the issue tracker or anything for a while, right? And this is this is by the way not related in my in my view to evaluating the technical direction of a project. Uh, are they technically working on the right thing? Um, so that's still something I think you know is a is a it's a different level of conversation. This is really more um, are the projects exhibiting the kinds of behaviors we need as open source projects um, uh, in terms of bringing new developers in, um, conducting their work in the public. Um, and showing the kind of help that uh, they need to be showing. I uh, let it say uh, I do agree with that. Uh, <laughs> Brian, because your governments have to be a daily thing, and uh, therefore the process is agile. So we need to ensure that if there are issues, they can be addressed in a timely manner. How best to do that? I think um, if TSE assumes most of the government is functioning, then it means that as soon as something needs to be addressed, then it should be brought to attention to TSE uh, to be looked at, uh, irrespective of what that issue is that it impacts the progress being made within the project. How best to do that? I can't say, but I still think, as you said, it should be addressed. Well, why don't we uh, um, why don't we continue this over over email a bit? Um, I definitely get the sensitivity of not wanting to create real extra work. My hope would be that the template that we come up with to fill out is something that somebody who is an active maintainer should be able to respond to in 30 minutes. You know, um, is not something that requires a lot of extra legwork to go get. And if it's healthy, if the project's healthy, it's steady state, is 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 not not reporting for the sake of reporting, but reporting so that the rest of us can maintain an ambient awareness of, um, of the, the, the health of each of the projects at, at Hyperledger. This is just, for those who've been involved in the Apache Software Foundation on managing projects, this is a key reason for why that process, when it works, it works well. Now, perfect, it doesn't catch everything, but um, if it didn't happen, you know, that, that community wouldn't have scaled to the way that they have. Um, with uh, with the reputation that they have. Um, anyways, um, just wanted to gin that up and and please uh, take a look at that thread um, and participate on it on the TSC. I, I do think I want to come back to the TSC with a specific proposal to vote on to adopt a template of some sort. Um, and so let's let's talk about what that is. But um, if uh, you know if it is not something that TSC wants to do, we can figure out a different approach as well. Um, but uh, I do think it's the right thing for the TSC to own. That's all I can say. Um, with that, any other thoughts or comments for the, for the call today? If not, we can give people 12 minutes back to their summer morning. Hey, Brian, uh, we got to talk a little bit later this morning. Do you want to uh, reach out on email and just try to knock that out real quick? Sure. Great. Okay. Send me a um, uh, phone number or whatever I can reach you at. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. It should be on the invite. Um, okay, uh, I guess that's it. Uh, talk to everyone soon. All right. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye bye.